There are. Good afternoon and welcome to the FEMA Region 2 Individual and Community Preparedness Webinar Series. My name is Allison Albright and I'm the Regional Preparedness Liaison for FEMA Region 2. I'm going to provide a few technical considerations before we begin. Today's proceedings are being recorded and captioned. The archived event will be available on the FEMA website in the coming weeks. You should hear audio through your computer speakers, so please ensure that your volume is turned up so you may hear the proceedings accordingly. In the top right corner, we ask if you'd like to receive news and updates from Region 2. If so, please enter your email address and we'll be sure to add you to the, the distribution list. We will have a question and answer session after the presentation concludes. You'll see a Q&A pod in the lower right-hand corner. Please feel free to submit your questions about the subject matter there and time permitting, we'll do our best to answer them. Finally, the PowerPoint presentation from today will be available for you to download in the file share pod as a PDF. You can click on the file and download it using the download button. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our Region 2 Community Preparedness Officer to introduce our speaker and today's proceedings. Good afternoon. Did you know that the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA's number one goal in our four-year strategic plan is to build a culture of preparedness? The Region 2 Individual and Community Preparedness Program is focused on preparing individuals and communities for disasters by providing useful information and training, inspiring people to take action and be ready for any emergency. I'm Debbie Costa, the Community Preparedness Officer for FEMA Region 2. On behalf of our team working to strengthen preparedness across the region, I'd like to welcome you to our preparedness webinar series. As part of FEMA's Goal 1, we're pleased to be hosting today's webinar on supporting mental health of young adults during the COVID-19 pandemic. Due to changes in plans and missed significant life events, youth are facing isolation, anxiety, and depression. In this webinar, you will learn symptoms, warning signs, and how to help young adults manage these challenging times. Our speaker today is Julie Lawrence. She is a licensed master social worker and is the Senior Assistant Vice President at Life is Precious Communal Life New York, Holistic Youth suicide prevention program serving Latina teens dealing with depression and suicide through expressive arts, music, case management, family engagement, and building connected, connectedness. Prior to coming to Life is Precious, Julie was the chief program officer at Girls Educational and Mentoring Services for 15 years where she worked with commercially sexually exploited and trafficked girls and young women become free from violence and develop to their full potential. Her core competencies and areas of expertise include positive youth development, suicide prevention, gender-based violence, commercial sexual exploitation and trafficking, youth and adult homelessness, social justice, mindfulness and self-care, vicarious trauma and trauma-informed care. Julie, thank you so much for joining us today. We really look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. I'm really, really happy to be here. I'm excited to share with you some of the work we do at Life is Precious and to kind of use that as a model to working with the young people in your life. Um, while not everyone will be suicidal, especially during these times, young adults and teenagers are dealing a lot with mental health concerns during the pandemic. So I really am happy to be here and, um, and open to questions, and we can talk at the end of the presentation. So today's um, agenda is to sort of acknowledge your role and your own concerns during this time to learn more about communal life and the life and the work of life is precious, to understand signs and risk factors for youth suicide and depression, and to understand how those risk factors and then the strategies that we use to overcome them can be applied to all youth. And then, of course, questions and answers. And at the end of the presentation, I have a few pages of some really good resources that I encourage folks to use. So um, who's in the room? I like to 
you know, generally we do this in person, and I like to know who's um, joining the group. And as I can see in the sh chat, we have people from, you know, all over the country, not just Region 2. I see some people from North Carolina, Pennsylvania, California, and I'm really um, happy you joined us. So basically, we want to make sure that you know that your well-being is essential. In order to help anyone in your life, you have to make sure you're taking time to keep, take care of yourself. These are very challenging times we're facing. We have a global pandemic. I like to use the word global when we talk about it so we can understand the depth of the um, difficulties that COVID-19 has brought to us. We have social unrest happening here in the United States, especially we saw it highlighted last week with the storming of the Capitol. Black Lives Matter is forcing us to look at and hopefully undo the systemic racism that we see in our society. There's a certain uncertainty about the future. Many, many people have faced unemployment and food and housing insecurity. But these are some really heavy and challenging times. But in order to help the young people in the life, you also must acknowledge that this has had an impact on you. So I really strongly encourage folks to really pay attention to themselves in order to help others in their lives. During COVID-19, we're facing new demands, new challenges, new ways of being, right? We were sort of automatically forced to look at work schedules and workload, other people are dealing with lots of job loss in communities, bed food and housing insecurity, collective sickness and death, and confronting that sickness and death. We've had over 375,000 deaths from COVID in the United States. And that's very, very deep and heavy on us. There's a fear for ourselves and our lo loved ones. So all of these sort of new changes really create traumatic stress for all of us. So the CDC has recently said that the impact of COVID-19 has considerably elevated mental health toll. So more than two in five U.S. residents report struggling with mental or behavioral health issues associated with COVID-19. A lot of people, right? So it's really important that we look at this and understand it a little bit better. The impact of stress has symptoms that come out in physical ways, behavioral ways, emotional ways, and this slide sort of lists a few. We get headaches, difficulty eating and sleeping, body aches, our memory can be impacted. We have low energy, low motivation, disengaging from sports, when religious gatherings, work, withdrawn from our daily activities, um, and then emotional symptoms. There's a lot of fear and sadness that people feel, a lot of anger and uncertainty. Has this, um, does this resonate with any of you? Have you guys experienced stress? Do you have an impact? Has it had an impact on your well-being? So basically, what is self-care then? And this slide shows someone yelling for Lassie, and then Lassie is going to a therapist, right? So we want to normalize that it's okay to take care of ourselves and to, to reach out to um, professional mental health people if we need that. Other ways of coping with stress are looking at your breath and thinking about breathing and breath. You have to stay up to date with current information around, regarding COVID, with accurate information and the vaccination rollout. Try to eat well, get enough sleep, and exercise daily. I was just talking with Debbie about exercising daily. And I have to get back into that routine. It's important that we do activities that we enjoy. It's important to be realistic to know about the things that you can control and then those that you cannot. And so not to stress over things that are not into your control. It's important to, to consult a mental health professional if the stress of COVID and all of the underlying stressors related to it are impacting you. It's good to minimize alcohol and smoking and it's really good to focus on relaxation and meditation. 
Right, so that's easy to list an, an example, but it's not always easy to do. So it's the key, I think, is to be gentle with yourself, to be gentle with others, take one step at a time, and develop a routine to help you kind of move forward. And pay attention to your breath. Starting with a one minute a day of a breathing meditation can be really, really beneficial. And I, I ask, do people want to try it? Should we try to do it for a minute? Yes? What do you think? So why don't you, I'm going to set the timer. Why doesn't everyone close their eyes for a minute? Take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Focus on your toes, wiggle your toes and release. Feel that energy going up your legs, your knees, your thighs, and your stomach. And take another deep breath. Breathe in and breathe out. Feel the energy moving up your body, relaxing your shoulders, relaxing your elbows, relaxing your fingers. Feel your nose and take another deep breath in and a deep breath out. And that's time. So that was one minute of a relaxation. I hope it sort of helped re release a little stress and keep you calm. And if you practice that every day, it will help. So I just want to give you a little history about the organization I work for. Communalife was founded in 1989, and the mission is to provide vulnerable communities with housing and culturally sensitive support services. Our vision is that no one should be without housing and the supports they need to live a healthy and meaningful life. Um, we offer over 2,000 units of affordable and supportive housing, so it's a very big part of the work we do. But the program that I work in, Life is Precious, is a community-defined suicide prevention program for Latina adolescents in New York City. Today I'm going to share a little bit about our work to help you understand um, how to help young people with mental health challenges during the, trans the pandemic. And the work we do at Life is Precious translates to all youth. To be a member of Life is Precious, you have to be Latina teen, you have to have a diagnosis, be in treatment, and be in school and have parental consent. Life is Precious is not a clinical program, though the foundation of our work is clinical. But we really are there to support young people who are in therapy and to, to provide wraparound services. We are working with Columbia University to um, to research the program and the model, and to hopefully um, it will become a community-based model for others. We're in phase two, and so um, we'll know in a few years about the model. You know, it takes a while for research. But a key concept to sort of understand around the work is behavioral health disparities. COVID-19 has shined a light on the health disparities and inequities in our communities and in the country. Um, and so it's important to see how racism and disparities impact the people we work with. In New York City, the Latinx population is almost 30 percent. Um, Eighty percent of Latinx people speak Spanish at home, and about half speaks English very well, and about half speak it not very well. This is just some stats about Latinx children in New York City. The majority of 40% uh, are living in poverty. 48% of all children receiving mental health services are Latina. And about 60% come from immigrant families. 
suicide behaviors among Latina adolescents. Um, very important to understand that suicide is a, one of this is the second leading cause of death for adolescents. These are stats from the CDC, and um, here's some other stats just to give an understanding of the issue at hand. This looks at um, the U.S., New York State, and then the city. And then this slide, I think, is interesting. It says, could someone help me with these? I'm late for math class. This young child is holding homelessness, sickness, hunger. So we're, the children and youth that we work with and are working with on a daily basis are facing so many issues that sometimes math class is the last thing on their mind. So these are some things to look at for children to understand risks for suicide ideation, right? Children and youth are dealing with pressure from school. They might be dealing with a bully at school. They might own and have access to a computer, which then gives them access to social media and online bullying. They might sometimes feel insecure. They might sometimes have body image issues. They might feel misunderstood. They might fight with parents or witness parents fighting and witness domestic violence in the home. They sometimes feel their parents don't care. They feel isolated and alone. They're sometimes left home alone because parents are working a lot or out. There might be a history of mental illness. There might be a history of child sexual abuse, and physical abuse, or child welfare involvement. And there's family pressures. Additional risk factors unique to Latinas is acculturation stress. So in school and friendships and employment, it's always sort of a sense of a difference. There's conflict among family members, familiarism, where it's a, um, the girls are often expected to sort of be the leaders in the family and um, have roles that are focused on the family instead of being able to do what they want to do. There's emotional isolation. And then no, new risk factors that we've seen of late is the vilification of immigrants and Latinos in particular. There's fear of deportation. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted black and brown folks more than anyone else. And then we've seen a heightened level of racism and xenophobia in this country. And these are all risk factors that impact young people. So who has those, who is dealing with those risk factors? Especially now, it's all youth are at risk of feeling sadness, depression, and uncertainty. So it's really critical that as the adults in young people's lives that we normalize talking about these mental health challenges and we normalize the need for mental health treatment. Of course, there are some special considerations for young people. Suicide and depression and mental health cut across all ages and races and income level, but there are some people who are at greater risk. We just spoke about some of the stats for Latina young people and also youth with disabilities, with mental health disorders and substance use disorders, LGBTQ youth who are unsupported in their identity. It's not about being LGBTQ, that's a risk factor, but it's a way, the way that your family and community supports or doesn't support you. Youth who have trauma histories, homeless youth, and other marginalized youth. These are special groups that we really need to pay attention to if they come into our daily um, interactions. <coughs> Excuse me. So while the risk factors are many and great and bear a very, very heavy burden, there are ways to help young people build protective factors that balance out those risk factors. Protective factors are personal, behavioral, or situational characteristics that contribute to a youth's resiliency and buffer them against the factor that increase risk. It helps to lessen the stress. And we've found, and research has shown, that one of the most significant protective factors for a young adult 
and a young youth is that they have a caring relationship with a trusted adult. For many youth, that person is a teacher, someone outside of their family. And that may even be you, right? So it's important to recognize that. Build protective factors. You have to build social connectedness. We do positive youth development activities. We provide wraparound support. At LIP, our girls have access to therapy and mental health clinics. We provide art and music therapy groups. We help them develop coping mechanisms, help them develop positive self-esteem. When cultural and religious beliefs are supportive and promote self-worth, it's very positive. And if there's a school environment that embraces mental health wellness and has a suicide prevention program in school, it's always very helpful. But life is precious. Some of the activities that help to build those are the intentional creation of a safe space and a community that supports healing and growth. We provide holistic case management services, which is really key, because if someone, when the pandemic happened, one of our girls, a few of them, didn't have computers to do their homework, then they weren't going to do well in school. So case management services helped families reach out to the school and get the laptops available. You know, so it's about providing them with concrete services to real needs that they have in the immediate. And once you are able to help someone get their birth certificate or help get them a laptop for school or help connect the parent to a job training, those are concrete ways to help secure that relationship and to help that young person and that family be more secure. We have really robust youth development groups. When you think about the pandemic, Young people are missing out on many developmental milestones. They're not leaving the house to go to school and develop on their own. They're missing out on many things. So it's really critical to have creative, robust groups and activities for young people to learn new skills, to meet other people, even remotely. We have, like I said, creative art therapies, which has proven to be an amazing way to help young people express themselves, especially if they're not very verbal or vocal or very, um, you know, have so much, all of those risk factors on their mind, to be able to join a music group or an art group to express themselves that way has been really, really effective. Another thing that we've seen has been really critical with teenagers and young adults is connecting them to civic engagement and social issues, especially now, you see a lot of young people are involved in understanding what's going on in this country, in looking at Black Lives Matter, in looking at elected officials and how they're helping their communities. So getting people connected with youth leadership and civic engagement is really critical. Finally, the academic support at <coughs> Life is Precious is also really has been key because we know that stressors of school and academics weigh heavy on young people. So we're able to provide them with tutors and SAT prep, different opportunities to help them with their school struggle. We do wellness activities, a lot of psychoeducational groups to destigmatize mental health, and then family engagement. Family engagement has been really critical as well because when you're working with a young adult and a teenager, it's important to have the whole family involved. So it helps create healthy communication, supports family needs. Um, we've been able to provide a weekly parent support group. It's been really critical in helping parents understand their own past trauma and to understand more about mental health and depression and destigmatize it so that they can understand their, their child better. And it's creating a community of support for the parents as well. 
building protective factors during COVID, right, we really have to help young people find creative ways to have a routine. Even small successes, helping create wake up time, make your bed, have a space of your own that you can do your schoolwork or your employment opportunities. And, and celebrating small successes often leads to bigger successes. Helping people, young people, create to-do lists. Helping them keep normal sleep schedule. Helping them develop new I hobbies or activities. Look at trainings online. Really um, think about ways to work with young people in new ways. There has to be a willingness for us to be open. And sometimes it's scared, uh, it's hard to talk to young people about things that are very difficult, right? And so it's, these questions are important to ask. What hurts? What helps? And what can I do to help? Young people will, if they think you're authentic and being your true self and showing real interest, they will tell you. What, ha what they need. And so it's important that at this time especially that we're able to ask that. What hurts? What helps? And what can I do to help? And then during this time, gratitude and social connectedness is also key. It's important to ask ourselves, how can we be a source of positive energy for the youth and young adults in our lives? What can we do? How can we be a source of connection for someone? Through all of the loss and fear and uncertainty, how can we show gratitude to others? And that's mostly what I had to, to share today. And so I would love to answer any questions. I know it's, it's going to be in the chat box. but um, I'm open to questions, open to talk about some of the ideas that I proposed. Thank you so much. We do have a few questions, and I would invite our audience to add additional questions while we're chatting. Um, but the first question is from Tracy Reed. And they write, I manage about two dozen young adults working in COVID-19 response, contact tracers, data analysis, case investigators. I would love to hear tips about supporting them as they are doubly impacted, both personally and professionally. Yeah, that's great work that they're doing. I. Um, I think one of the most important things, like we said, like I said in the beginning, even for us, is to get good um, information about COVID, right? Uh, it's really important that they are mindful of all the precautions we're supposed to take, and I'm sure you do with them, right? Wearing masks, socially distancing, washing their hands, just being really clear about those guidelines that can help just uh, relieve some of the stress. But I think it's important if you have a group of young people working together, it would be really critical, I think. I always like to have an opportunity for them to have a chance to talk with each other about the stressors that they're doing, kind of have a rap group kind of at work <coughs> with someone who might be a social worker or can help support them in that process but allow them the opportunity to have a safe space to process all of the challenges that they're feeling or going through, to see you know, what issues that they're facing. So I think kind of making an intentional space each week, like once a week, sort of a group supervision, but really making it about a process of um, letting them talk things through, and then being a person there who's calm and can help them learn some of the calming relaxation exercising, the grounding exercises for when stress, when, like that's a really stressful job, right? And so to allow them the opportunity to vent in a way that won't impact their, 
you know, their employment. But especially young people who are also, maybe it's sometimes their first jobs, they're learning these things. So giving them opportunities for leadership and development, too, is really important. I hope that you. answered your question. I would say you did. <laughs> what do you think is the best way to deal with constant fear of what might happen? Yeah, constant fear, that goes back to one of the things I had talked about earlier, and it's, it's actually quite easy to say but more difficult to do, which is to maybe make a list to know the things that you have control over and, the, and then also the things that you don't have control over, right? So the fear is because we're in a state of unknown, right? We don't really know. This is the first time for all of us to have a global pandemic in our midst. So it's about helping them know and get good, accurate information, and then taking safety precautions for themselves, and then learning some of those relaxation exercises, quite honestly, and paying attention to breath, eliminates some fear in their body, in the physical, right? And then the other fear is also normalizing, that it's okay to have some fear, but, you know, helping them balance and make pros and cons lists is always a good way to balance what you know and what you don't know. But that's a tough one. Fear is, um, fear is a real emotion that has a physical and emotional impact. And so it's helping someone just know as much as they can about what they're fearful of and then helping them do some relaxation. Yeah, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not a professional, but I would think that just, you know, acknowledging, you know, what you have control over and what you don't have control over, I think acknowledging and accepting that would probably go a long way. Yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, that was one of the first things I wrote and in, in for all of us because we have, there, there's so much that we don't know. And then, right, unfortunately, we all got some mixed messages about COVID-19. We didn't, you know, it wasn't very clear. But now there are some really good resources. The, it's important to learn as much about the vaccine as possible. Right, it's just helping people get real, accurate, clear information and helping them process that. Exactly. Have um, evictions, uh, have you had many clients where they've been affected yeah. by evictions? We've had, um, we, well, New York has a moratorium on evictions. Um, so people have not been evicted from their homes during this time. But we have many clients who are super fearful of that. Um, many of the people we work with in Life and Precious, about 50% of our families are undocumented. So many, didn't, many lost employment but never received any sort of federal support. Very scary time. But so... There are places in communities that work with um, people who are in fear of eviction to help with some financial support. We were able to get a grant from Hispanic Federation in the beginning of the pandemic. We're able to give each family $300, right? So there are ways and resources in all of our communities that you just have to kind of reach out to and help people with. But the fear of eviction is, is really scary, right? Yeah. Yep. You go from living paycheck to paycheck to living on exactly. the street. Exactly, exactly. Oh. And then for young people too, right, A another developmental milestone, some, you know, late teens, early 20s, that's the time when people, you know, try to move out of their family home try to live independently, and then this whole 
pandemic really turned that around for so many people, right? So uh, the impact is so big. Very widespread. Mm -hmm. How um, best can you approach a situation where youth are hesitant to talk about their mental health? Yes, that is a big one. For many youth, there's a stigma involved, maybe not even for the youth, but for the families they come from. There is a lot of stigma, you know, a stigma um, associated with mental health challenges or reaching out for mental health support. I think it's actually a really good opportunity to normalize that right now. And you can look at the stats, you can look, you can Google it right now. So like two in five Americans are having mental health challenges because of COVID, right? So we, you, it's, it's good to present them with psychoeducation, right? To um, educate people about what mental health challenges are and what they look like and to normalize it. And I think it's easier to do right now because it's in the news. It's so prevalent that people are talking about it a little bit more. And so <laughs> sometimes I've used even examples if someone has like serious depression and medicine is recommended, right, to normalize that and be like, and talk about like, if you had diabetes, you wouldn't think twice about getting your insulin, right? There's some kind of a chemical, physical issue going on with your brain that sometimes the medicine helps adjust and helps you feel, start feeling better. So really kind of normalizing it and incorporating it into the whole physical wellness. And then um, the more information people have, the better they feel about it. Yeah, a lot of it is the fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Can you maybe provide a few examples of um, positive actions that we could take to support the adolescents in our lives? Sure. I think um, the most important thing, I would say, is being consistent and authentic. And so that's if you tell a young person that you're going to do something for them, that you do it, right? You don't just, it's not just about words, it's about actions as well. And bringing your authentic self for them. Teenagers and young people can read adults way better than we think, and they know if you're being real or not, right? And so you always want to be real with the young person. And it's also important to be able to say, if you don't know something or you're unsure about it, to let them know. You know, I actually, I really don't know. Why don't we look into that together? And so try to make it like a team effort, right? And then consistency and an openness to just being, just letting them know that you're there for them is so important. A young person in the beginning may not want to open up, but if they see that, if you see them daily or every week, you're checking in, you're letting them know that you're there and that you want to help them, it's really, really important. Good advice. How do we begin to support socially anxious youth who will be struggling to emotionally and mentally transition back to normal life after the pandemic mm -hmm. ends? So basically for those youth who the isolated time has been more of a comfort than a death. Right, right. That's, that's a great, great question. We've been so focused on, right, the quarantining and isolation. I think it's really important to ha help young people continue some kind of a routine. So even though they might be going to school remotely, they, everything's remotely, to really encourage some kind of a routine where they're still checking in with one or two friends a week, right? That they're still 
that maybe they're using a journal to be able to process some of their feelings, um, and then to just slowly figure out how that's going to look, because it, that's another thing. We're still a little bit unclear and uncertain. When is it going to go back to normal, and will things ever really be, quote unquote, normal again? And so I think it's like, you know, I actually have a daughter who's about to be 15, and in the beginning of the pandemic, she would, like, not leave her room. And so it really became concerning for me. So I've made a point of at least twice a week, I make her, like, you know, I don't make her. I really encourage her to come and take a walk around the park with me, right? So it's, like, recognizing that, yes, we have to be safe and we have to, like, uh, quarantine and stay at home, there are still small and healthy ways to go outside and to go get some fresh air and to go see people, right? Um, so I think it's like taking it step by step and developing a routine and allowing that young person to talk about those fears. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I want to help struggling youth but I've not had firsthand experience with homelessness, job loss, et cetera. How can I approach certain topics when I myself have not had them? Well, I think that's a good question. You know, for about 15 years, I, I was an ally and I worked with girls and young women who were commercially sexually exploited and trafficked. One of the key kind of components of our work there was survivor leadership and really um, focusing on helping young people and people who, like, who have exited the sex industry to become leaders in the field. So we, we were really, really about supporting young people to work at GEMS. We would hire survivors because it's critical that young people see other people succeeding um, who have faced similar challenges. But I, I, I wasn't trafficked and I hadn't been sexually exploited. And that didn't impact really the way I worked with the young people. It's about bringing, like I had to be my true self, right? And so I didn't pretend I knew <laughs> everything that they went through. I didn't pretend I could understand it the way that other survivor, like survivors might have been able to. But I was, I was a person that was there, that was consistent, that was an open ear, that was unconditionally loving them for who they were and helping support them to become, you know, free from the life and free from violence. And so you don't necessarily have to have experienced what other people have to have empathy and to have an understanding of what those challenges are. And so it's really important not to fake it and not to pretend like you totally get what they're going through. It's important to not pretend that you even understand youth culture fully, right? But that you are someone who has their health and wellness in mind and that you're there to support them no matter what. I think the more authentic and real you are with young people, the better it is and that it can go a long way. So you don't necessarily have to have had experiences of that, but you can see that a young person who's homeless, you, hopefully you can understand how challenging that is and all the difficulties that they're going through. And so you know, you can be real with them around that and say, this must be really, really hard. What is it that helps and what can I do to help? How can I help? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, that, that, that brings us into the next question, which is, how can we help uh, the young adults ask for help as they express their fears? How to help someone ask for help. Yeah. Hmm. I think that's a great question. And it makes, it forces us to, to look at it, right? Just like I said, it's so easy to sort of list ways to do self-care. But 
you know, do we actually, how do we do it? And so I think um, it's important that young people see that we ask for help sometimes, that we don't know all the answers. And so when they see that it's okay and not, um, no one looks at you like you have five eyes, right, if you're asking for help, that this is a process that, that everyone needs help at times. Um, I don't know. That's, a, that's hard, though. I think it's more in the practice of when you're with a young person that maybe we, there are some things that we can maybe identify before they can that they might need help with and to offer it, right? Like just a small example with like life is precious, we offer the tutoring because we know and with research that academic stress is a big stress on young people. And so most of the girls don't come in saying, oh, I need a tutor, I need help. But we say, oh, every Tuesday and Wednesday at 4 o'clock, this tutor, Rebecca, is there. She's on Zoom. She's ready for you. So we give them the opportunity to address some of their needs without them asking. And so then once they sort of see that there is help, that we're authentic in what we're saying, that we really have concrete resources to offer them, then I think people are more open to asking for help as well. Right. Frank writes, I've, I've found that many youth are attached to devices, which was okay yes. when they had social interactions at school, right? Mm -hmm. But now it's all devices, even just, hey, let's go to Burger King doesn't work for COVID. So what would you recommend on increasing social interactions? Yeah, this is, this is a very, very interesting point, and I think one that researchers are really looking at um, and exploring now because it's the first time, right, that young, peop young people have, are way more advanced than us, most of us, right? Um, and so I don't know. This is an interesting development that we have to explore. But I think, like we were saying earlier, helping create some kind of routine that is away from the phone, going outside for a walk, taking your dog out for a walk, getting outside somehow. Um, we, my daughter met some friends the other day in a park and they sat at a, you know, in a big circle outside when it was a little bit warmer so they weren't close to each other. But allowing them to, it's hard. We have to figure out ways to help them disconnect from the um, phone and from the computer. But it's a hard process. Yeah, certainly is. Mm -hmm. I have one question um, myself. I was wondering if you were aware if there are similar agencies like the work that you're doing mm -hmm. uh, with Latina girls in New York City, but even if there are similar agencies doing work for all youth in New York State or New Jersey or any of our um, Region 2 states that we could mm -hmm. direct people to or where to look for that information. Sure. I, um, I don't know of any other like suicide prevention wraparound programs like um, Life is Precious, but there are a few really great youth programs um, like The Door, which is a downtown program that works with young people from ages 12 to even 24. Um, that offer lots of classes and case management and support services. Is that New um, York City specific? That's New York City. Um, that is, you know, in, the re in, the, in my resources, I think there are a few programs in the beginning. Oh, well, the crisis text line. The Trevor, Trevor Project does a lot of work with LGBTQ youth, um, and that's a national program. Um, but, and Julie, I, 
I did notice something in the in the in general. If people have questions for you, can they contact you? Um, yes, definitely. And I did see somebody mentioned, hey, you know, we have a project that we're working on that I think you know might be something we could work on together. Um, mm -hmm. Is it okay for them to reach out to you at this email address here? Yes, most definitely. Please do. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you for the presentation. Like I said, we have not covered this topic, and uh, the information is, is priceless. We really do appreciate you taking the time today. And to our participants, our attendees, we put a very short poll up on the screen. There's three questions there. It helps uh -huh. us to drive future programming. There's also a download pod on the screen where you're able to download a PDF of today's presentation oh, in its entirety. So all of these links um, are not only hot on the screen right now, but they're also hot in the PDF. And, Excellent. Um, yeah, yeah, so everybody could download that. And I just want to make you aware of some of the upcoming webinars that we have. You know, this has become a, um, a great series for us. I know I mentioned to Julie earlier we did 110 webinars last year with 30,000 participants. Wow. Um, and yeah. we are in the process of getting ready to release a catalog, um, which has a, a table of contents by category for all of the webinars that we did with links to the recordings so you could you could see the Adobe Room just like you're looking at it now with the real-time captioning um, for any of the webinars that we did this year. But uh, we will be doing today's uh, presentation in Spanish on uh, Thursday of this week. Next Thursday we have powerful presentations as one of our communication webinars. We have a COOP webinar coming up for Houses of Worship, so how do churches and synagogues and temples, how do they continue their service delivery following a disaster that impacts them? You know, they need mm -hmm. to have these continuity plans in place. Uh, the USDA will be talking about um, different programs and funds that they have for Puerto Rico. We're going to talk about the Puerto Rico Core Advisory Groups. And um, we are doing a 10 webinar series along with all FEMA regions. So we started last week with Region 1. This week is our webinar on CERT. And next week uh, we will be co-hosting with Region 3. And every week um, through the end of March, with the exception of uh, Inauguration Day, we will be co-hosting webinars on preparedness with the other regions. So Excellent. all of these are in the PDF. You're welcome to take a look and click on them. If not, the link on your screen right now will take you to any of our upcoming webinars, any of our recordings. If you don't already get FEMA Region 2 News, just click that subscribe button. And if you need to reach me or Allison or Bibi or anybody on the preparedness team, uh, we monitor this uh, generic uh, mailbox. Please feel free to reach out to us. Again, right. Julie. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to our thank attendees. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Everybody, I'm giving you back seven minutes of your day. We have seven, we <laughs> ended seven minutes early today. Uh, everyone, have a beautiful day. Go outside, take a walk, get your 15 minutes of vitamin D, and uh, we'll see you on the next webinar. Be free to drop. Thank you. Thank you.